So the story of crucifixion. As we know from the story, from the Gospels, that once Christ was seized and identified through that Judas kiss and essentially was put through um, well, there was no trial, essentially. Remember that encounter with Pontius Pilatus? Where the fate of Christ was decided, essentially, between the voices of the mob and the one who's supposed to hold the power washing his hands off of the deeds. Remember that encounter when essentially unable to make decision on his own. Unable to make decision, Pontius Pilate asks the crowd what shall we do? And the crowd of course goes Yeah, they crucify him, crucify him. So we know the rest. And there was this encounter, you see, this encounter between Pontius Pilate and Christ. What could that encounter signify? What could it represent from the subtler perspective? From more internal, esoteric perspective? Well, it, it kind of and becomes very tempting to see this as the two structures now facing each other. Two consciousnesses, as it were, facing each other. Two governing bodies. One that is essentially represent, represented by Pontius Pilate, the outlived structure. The structure which is basically impotent and that what is exemplified in Jesus as that awakened fully reasoned consciousness which essentially stands there uncompromisingly despite from if we are based on the story despite all the odds despite all that distribution of power. Yet it is quite obvious even how it was portrayed, where the real power rests. The real power, the real confidence, the integrity is exemplified in the figure, in the Jesus. And Pontius Pilate comes across essentially, as that deeply shaken, deeply insecure and ready to collapse structure. You've got here perfectly tantric perspective, if you will. You've got here perfectly internal perspective. All that was prior to awakening of your own consciousness exemplified by this existing governing structure where all these as it were, conglomerate of intellect, ego, mind and the senses were kept intact, instructing us in all our affairs what it is and what it is not. This structure is now deeply shaken, shaken to its very core, to the very core. In a way, there is a <clears throat> Pontius Pilate was obviously portrayed like this, but also as essentially someone who is totally, totally, totally despicable in his acts because he washes his hands, and this is what became the proverbial metaphor for removing oneself from making decisions.
removing oneself from any responsibility whatsoever. Because although responsibility, we could say, we could argue, we could begin to speculate, he could have just ruled in favor of Christ. He could have said, no, not guilty. And Christ would have, be, would have been spared and could have carried on teaching. Why not? No? A possibility? One of the outcomes among the many? Why not? But you see, this is maybe in the story, we wish that to happen. We wish that what Pontius Pilate would decide. And we feel deeply outraged by that decision. Outraged, and it makes us even more compassionate towards the sufferings that the Christ is about to undergo. But here you are invited also to contemplate another side of this. Pontius Pilate here is not unlike Judah, who simply fulfills, fulfills that what essentially is the prophecy. Nothing that outlive structure can do. Nothing it can do. It understands that it's now being faced and faced off. It doesn't matter, just like boring the example of the Bhagavad Gita, that the Kuravas decided to have the whole army because the two brothers who represent the uh, clans, the cousins, the, ca the, the Pandavas and Kur Kuravas were cousins. They were brought by the same blind king, Dhritarashtra. When the choice, essentially, when the dice was thrown and the choice, essentially, to decide whether Krishna or his army would be fighting on one of the sides, Krishna made the condition that here is his army, mighty army of Krishna. And you can choose between his army or Krishna himself. But he will not be involved. In other words, he would restrain from the fight. He will not be involved in actual combat, not in the fighting itself. And when the choice falls in the hands of Duryodhana, who was the one of the sons of Dhritarashtra, he obviously chooses the army. He chooses the obvious visible force. And Krishna, therefore, would be Arjuna's charioteer. Why did I draw this parallel here? Is that Pontius Pilate's decision to give the fate of Christ into the hands of the mob, into the hands of the crowd, it also could be seen from that internal perspective. Because the existing structure that essentially has been empowered so far by that apparent individuality, that egoic structure, would never, never assume the authorship or the governing authority over the higher self. So therefore, the higher self has to be sacrificed. What, what I'm saying, saying here is that we need to also understand the dynamics of the process of awakening, that up until the governing structure prior to the awakening is intact fully, it will do all it can to jeopardize the rising consciousness. And it does. And we know that. We know how many sabotages there are. And you can supplement this with other understandings, more esoteric in nature. How all these tamasic and rajasic tendencies and so forth
trying to abstract that process, which is essentially there to overthrow that and to establish a new, new reign. And the new reign here is the reign that is represented by Christ consciousness, the kingdom of heaven. That's what Christ consciousness essentially represents. So once the faith is sealed and Christ has been given to punishment before the execution, he first was given to punishment. Whether if we look at it from the narrative and literal side of the story, whether this was a regular punishment present in the Roman Empire in the, at the time, or whether there's something extra was added to that, is beside the point. But there are some allusions, essentially, just as Christ's body is being lynched, as the Christ's body is being um, given to tremendous pain and suffering before the actual task of carrying the cross to the Golgotha will take place. I simply invite you to look at it from the perspective of the awakening processes themselves. This is exactly, exactly what at times awakening presents present itself. It's those, those phases of pain. And it doesn't have to be always just physical pain. It's all this pain of all kinds, emotional, psychological, and of course, that includes bodily pains. It's like sweating blood. The pain which is accompanied by transformative processes. Whether the narrative exaggerated this, perhaps, maybe there was this artistic license, creative license to invoke something in us while we are being given to the reading into the story. Because it literally invokes this very, very compassionate feelings and thoughts. Though I have to confess, as a footnote, when I watched Mel Gibson's version of of Christ. I don't know if you remember, if any of you watched, watched it. That film made me literally sick, physically ill, because of its, um, not just because of its graphic uh, representation of that, you know, but something about it was very gross, very well filmed and you know, like beautiful casting, but something was very, was very painful to watch and the effect was not elevating. It was not uplifting, it was not transcending. It was actually leap one ill. Well, at least that's how I felt it. That's how I felt it. So therefore, one has to be able to see and penetrate this story with enough enough transparency of seeing what is actually taking place. So we don't overdo and go into this how. Otherwise we're left on that level where perhaps deliberation in invoking very strong feelings. And if we take it all too literal, we'll miss something which is being conveyed there. And from there, the carrying of the cross begins, that the road to Golgotha, <clears throat> literally the road to Golgotha is marked by the 
classically spoken of 14 Stations of the Cross. I'm not going to go into each and every one of them. I don't even think I remember each and every one. And in, not, in all, not all traditions agree on exact order and exactness of the events or the importance of each particular event. Some vary. But there is some, some similarities. And the main similarities are in, in the, the Stations of the Cross literally exemplify these phases, if you will. If we translate it into the esoteric language, phases, we could say, of the ascent of consciousness itself. They are stations of the cross. All the way to the Golgotha, where the actual crucifixion, crucifixion takes place. And you remember some of you, right? That when, for example, Christ, that famous encounter with Veronica, when she compelled to you know, overwhelmed and compelled and to relieve his pain in spots in somewhat ways, she rushes to wipe the blood and sweat of his face and places the veil, a handkerchief, I don't know, a, a tissue, a scarf on his face and ends up with the complete image of Christ's face, face on it, which is known in the history of arts as the veil of Veronica. And there are other encounters that how when Christ addresses the woman of the Galilee, or those classically spoken of falls, Christ falls three times notoriously, falls and rises like the first that the Christ falls first time and then at some point he is being helped to carry the cross at some point as part of the stations Christ being disrobed I don't know if you remember that as well the disrobing of Christ towards the later phases so he is now naked. Somehow, not going into the details of the story, not going into the exactly what was happening. And it's, you can just imagine so many uh, different perspectives on that, so many different takes on that. But what these Stations of the Cross represent, all the way to Crucifixion, with Golgotha and the cro Cross itself, is that essentially, one way or the other, we all are, it's not just in relation to now, the actuality of the arising of consciousness exemplified by your own unleashed latent power. But I will suggest you to see it also from the perspective of understanding that this, this takes place at all times. There is this kind of alignment that what is exemplified by the cross is something which essentially everyone is facing at all times. Everyone is going through these stations. As we go through life, through phases of life, through phases of our evolution, through phases of our relationships, through anything that we go through, that is phases of the cross, stations of the cross. Because there is this necessity to constantly reconcile vertical with horizontal, constantly. So that what really crucifixion represents here, it, it, it's that mystery of the reconciliation of the horizontal dimension of existence, horizontal plane of life, 
with all that it exemplifies, with its vertical dimension. So it is from that perspective I would like to speak of the crucifixion all the way to its culminative events when Christ is actually being nailed to the cross and died on a cross. And there is, what I'd like to draw your attention here is that exclamation that when Christ was on the cross, and it is the first time, as it were, when he actually laments, you know, Father, why thy forsake, forsake me? It's that at that moment, that very, very moment, it's as if, as if, how it is being very often interpreted, Christ loses his own, his own faith in the Father. Father, where are you? You know, can't you see the enormous suffering of your son? And it gave birth to this whole culture, to this whole culture of lacrimosa, the sea of, the sea of tears. It's this culture of lament, literally comes out. Out of this one, this very, very profound moment when Christ is speaking to his own Father. However, of course, this is where the creative license of the, the way we interpret the Gospels, one can take it into any dimension. And literally, it could create cathartic experience when turned into any form of art. But there is another hidden dimension to this. Just as Christ, which exemplifies that awakened soul, fully awakened soul, dies on the cross, it's as it were the duality gives way. In other words, this is direct, direct experience of merging of what is now subject, or rather, let's say, the seer and the seen. This is why, th Father, where, why though forsake me. It is more compelling to see this as a very, very concealed metaphor for essentially experience of God consciousness. The merging, the merging of one with the other. Because at that moment, right after that moment, the Christ, Christ dies. So in other words, the individual soul literally ceases to exist. So that what was said to be fulfilled in the prophecies, is now being fulfilled. And crucifixion here exemplifies just that. Now, not to undermine for a moment the sheer beauty and the intensity of the story portrayed in the Gospels. And this is again, take it or leave it. I myself don't tend to see that Christ was actually crucified, physically nailed with metal, iron, nails into the wooden cross. All this necessitates the, if you will, 
again, born out of that necessity of the artistic license to create some kind of impact, to give the story to the impact. The impact. But it seems to me that the story itself already en has entered the subtle realm of dimension, when to read it literally is to be essentially blinded to what the real story is about. So if we are to be confronted with it, so what about the real Christ? What about the real Jesus? What happened to him? Was he crucified? How it all took place? I don't exclude the possibility that essentially just like with all great, with all great seers and prophets who came to reestablish the Dharma, who came to bring revolutionary teaching, he was just that. He was just the being who simply taught. But when the time came to essentially create the institution out of it, very elaborate story was put forth to create create this intensity of the crucifixion where perhaps what the direct disciples of Christ, direct students, direct followers had it written as a form of a scripture. And as we know, scriptures never talk in the open language. All scriptures speak in esoteric language. No one in their right mind would read Bhagavad Gita just as it is. You need to have someone who will expound on these verses. And that is relevant to all scriptures. So if we are to treat the story of Christ as a scripture based on some of the existing relics and documents, because we know that there are many gospels, there were many gospels, only one of them was chosen as a blueprint but we don't know. Do we know the authenticity of how it was interpreted? And why is it interpreted in a direct, straight into your face way? What if this was elaborate metaphor of a spiritual transformation with a cross as that metaphor and crucifixion what conveys the internal processes? But then we end up with the external picture. And then the in internal esoteric dimension is as it were goes in the background and actually quite frankly becomes less relevant because it all happened with Christ. Christ already paid for the sins and we are all eagerly waiting for the second coming. So it's creating religion out of spiritual teaching. It's creating elaborate system out of spiritual teaching which is alive. Alive and pregnant with the possibilities of actualizing this within one's own being. Therefore for me Christ is not undermined when he is not actually physically, as a being who walked this earth, has been crucified. Perhaps he had to go into exile. We never know. Perhaps he was simply killed. Just like that. That's the simple, simple act of execution without even necessity of any public display on that. Perhaps... He was ignored even. Who cares? Last Roman Empire. You know, bunch of like ragamuffins running around, you know, and talking about love. What's the big deal about it? Right? You know, why would Pontius Pilatus pilot, pilot has to lose his sleep over it? Where's the mutiny? Where is the revolution? I don't see any. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what was like, you know, coming and creating havoc in one of the temples, throwing out the tradesmen? That's not a big deal, I'm sorry. It's a Roman Empire. Much bigger events happen, happened there. If Christ, if the events spoken in the Gospels were that important, they would have been at least recorded in Roman Chronicles. Nothing is left there. Not one word, not one entrance. Were they so afraid that they will eradicate it from the history? Unlikely. Unlikely. 
it's time to also see things in their like simplicity of their light so we can see the profound inner content profound inner essence rather contained within the story Christ does not become less if he was son of Jesus, son of Joseph. What's, what's wrong for being of the Joseph gene? You tell me. Why do we have to believe in the Immaculate Conception? Huh? Why does he have to come out of the womb just because Gabriel whispered some formula. <laughs> hmm? this, this is where essentially re-evaluation and deeper understanding that what it represents, of course, is not that somehow the laws that here are governing this beautiful universe, you know, and the biology, what's wrong with biology of the events? Why biology is less sacred? Why sperm and blood is less, sac less sacred? Now you need to understand that separating spirit and matter is what religion is good at. Creating heaven and hell, that's what it's good at. Because as long as you have this, you are forever divided and forever will seek reconciliation. And then you are obviously in hands of the custodians or in hands of that sense of the original split, original sin. But soon as it's taken into your own hands, there is this freedom can be tasted. Divine freedom here and now. It's the force to reckon with. So coming out of these centuries of the indoctrination, which was serving political aims. Again, I will take you out of the context of this, just and place you, fourth century. Just Google and see what was actually happening at that time in the Western hemisphere, in the Western world, in Western culture. See what was happening in the fourth century. And see the decision, this decision to take the sacred teaching and turn it into the most powerful political tool, tool for control and subjugation of the will of those who will essentially only give it all. Because it's so powerful, I mean it's so powerful, the story is so powerful. So much Shakti in it. It's a simple act of manipulation, nothing else. Pure manipulation, unabashed. That's what Nietzsche meant, God is dead. Nietzsche meant God is dead as God outside somewhere there. The Christian idea of the God is dead. There is no Father residing in heaven. There is no heaven and earth and hell. None of that exists. It's all, all perplexities of the mind. All these categories exist right here, right now, in our own mind instead. We are, we are literally perpetuators of that heaven, purgatory and hell, right here, right now, at every moment. 